Good afternoon from Haskell Hall in the Church of the Redeemer in Ruston, Louisiana in the United States. Um, I'm the Reverend Frank Hughes and I'm priest in residence at the Church of the Redeemer uh, and also a New Testament scholar. We are putting together a seven session class on Matthew. And so today's class is session one out of seven. In today's class, uh, I'll give you a general introduction to the gospel according to Matthew. And also we will look um, a bit at Matthew chapter one, verse one through chapter two, verse 12. And so uh, um, we've already recorded uh, session two. Um, this is a re-recording of session one since uh, we had a little operator error on session one, namely I, I, it was my error. And so, uh, but also we had a lot of questions uh, during that class session with actual people here in the parish hall. And so uh, we got a little bit off the track and so this will be a little bit tighter than what we, when we actually presented session one uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, there are many different interpretations of the Gospels. Um, and you will hear in this class different interpretations of Matthew from me. Uh, some of the views that you will hear from me, you probably have never heard before. Um, and so I emphasize that this is not your mother or father's Sunday school or your grandmother's or grandfather's Sunday school from the 1960s or before. Um, we believe that the text of the Bible is inspired. The original text of the Bible is inspired. However, our interpretations of the text of the Bible are not considered to be inspired. And all translations of the Bible of course, are interpretations. And so um, I don't claim that my interpretation is uh, inspired. However, I do claim that it is the most likely interpretation of Matthew based on the information that we have from the ancient world. By the way, if you're going to study the Bible, you need, um, unless you can read Greek and Hebrew and maybe Aramaic, um, you're going to need an English translation. Um, and so here it, at Redeemer, we have a bunch of copies of the older Revised Standard Version. Uh, and then there's also the revision of the RSV, which is called the New Revised Standard Version, of which there is now an updated edition, the NRSV UE. Um, and that just came out, uh, the updated edition just came out, and I got a copy uh, when I was in Denver at the SBL meeting. In the 1960s, many of us were very taken with the Jerusalem Bible. Uh, in the 80s, there was a revision of the Jerusalem Bible. Um, in 1970, the entire New English Bible was published, although the New Testament had come out in the 60s. Um, and then in the 80s, uh, the New English Bible was revised um, and improved, I think, and it became known as the Revised English Bible. There's also a, a translation made by conservative evangelicals called the New International Version, the NIV, and they did a really good update of it in the year 2011, and so I would recommend that. There's also a, another translation of the Bible that's written in rather simpler English than many of us are perhaps used to when we hear the Bible, and it's called the Common English Bible, the CEB. Several of the booksellers and denominations sponsored that translation. So those are the ones I would recommend. Um, I don't recommend any paraphrase, such as the Message or the Living Bible. Um, and uh, I don't recommend the King James Version, nor do I recommend the revision of it known as the New King James Version. Um, I think it ought to be a translation of the Bible that is accurate. Uh, I don't really care whether a translation of the Bible is written in beautiful English um, because, well, it, the Bible was not written in English. The Bible was written in Biblical Hebrew, Biblical Aramaic, and Hellenistic Greek. Uh, 
And so sometimes things that are good Hebrew or Greek really do not translate well into English. And so the main thing that I want when I read a translation in English or any other vernacular language, I want the translation to be accurate and I want the translation of the New Testament to be based on a really good edited text of the New Testament based on the earliest manuscripts and best manuscripts that we have. Certainly the King James Version would not, in, that would not include the King James Version. Um, there are some study Bibles that are very, very useful. Uh, there is a Baylor uh, study Bible, which came out fairly recently. Um, the Harper Collins study Bible, edited by Harry Attridge, uh, is excellent. And then the um, fifth edition of the New Oxford Annotated Bible, um, edited by Mark Brettler and Fame Perkins and others, uh, it also is excellent. So I would say either the Baylor Study Bible or the HarperCollins Study Bible or the New Oxford Annotated Bible, uh, all three of which use the New Revised Standard Version translation, um, I would say any of those three would be really good. And here is a calendar of our schedule uh, for this class. Well, let's talk first about the New Testament. The New Testament is really important to us as Christians because the New Testament is the earliest collection of writings about Jesus and about early churches. Uh, and uh, I've been saying the New Testament is a collection of collections of literature, but actually it would be more uh, accurate to say the New Testament is a collection of collections of collections of early Christian writings. Um, it is the only collection of early Christian writings that mostly comes from the first century, the same century as Jesus and St. Paul. And so, uh, if you're looking for the most historical information about Jesus, or if you're looking for the most historical information about the first generation or second generation of Christians, your best source um, are uh, the, your best source is the New Testament. And as I mentioned, most of the New Testament comes from the first century of the Common Era or the first century A.D. Other early Christian sources generally come from the second century A.D. or C.E. onwards. Um, the Gospels have a great deal in common. First of all, they present the message about Jesus in the context of the unfolding of the life of Jesus. And the Gospels fit very well into the Greek biography genre. Uh, I'm thinking of the important work of uh, Professor Richard Burridge now, uh, his book called What Are the Gospels? Um, so the Gospels fit very well into the Greek biography genre. And in addition to, you know, an unfolding of the life of Jesus. They also include appeals for the readers to become followers of Jesus or better followers of Jesus. And so uh, the Greek biography genre is a very interesting genre. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are more like a biography than anything else. And there are differences between the four Gospels. And because of the profound differences between John on the one hand and Matthew, Mark, and Luke on the other hand, New Testament scholars refer to Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the synoptic gospels based on two Greek words, syn and optimi, which together mean viewed together. And so the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke and they are very like each other, and the reason they are, of course, is that Matthew and Luke use Mark as a source, most likely. Uh, John may also have used Mark as a source. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but there's been a lot of discussion about that. Um, the different Gospels in the New Testament uh, are um, of different lengths. Um, counting the... the um, the standard Greek text, the Nestle Allen edition of the, of the Gospels, uh, 
There are 101 pages of Matthew. There are 75 pages of Mark. There are 115 pages of Luke, and there are 86 pages of John. By the way, Luke is the longest book in the New Testament, and second place goes to the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, and third place goes to Matthew. And you can see Mark is considerably shorter than they are, the other two synoptic gospels, um, and shorter than John. Um, and if you were to count the verses in Matthew and Luke, you would see that there are over a thousand verses in Matthew and over 600 verses in Mark and over 1,100 verses in Luke. And when you compare the content of those verses in Matthew, Mark, and Luke with each other, you can see that only 31 verses of Mark are not reproduced or not found in maybe slightly different ways, but the same basic stuff. Um, only 31 verses of Mark are not reproduced in Matthew and Luke, or both Matthew and Luke. Um, and so, on the basis of uh, that, and on the basis of the order in which we find material in Matthew and Luke in comparison with Mark, um, you can see that Matthew and Luke have Mark and material in common, and when they have it in common, it is virtually always in the Mark and order. Also, Mark is in uh, not the best Greek, and Matthew and Luke uh, are in better Greek than Mark. Um, if you're going to copy somebody and you're going to do something to their Greek, you're going to try to make their Greek better, right, rather than try to make it worse. And so in particular, Matthew loves to correct Mark's Greek and improve it. And so on the basis of the order of the material in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and on the basis of the length of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, when you compare the three together, most scholars come to the conclusion that there's a literary relationship between Matthew and Mark, which is to say Matthew and Mark were not parallel eyewitnesses of Jesus. Rather, it means that the writer of Matthew had a written copy of the gospel according to Mark, uh, or vice versa. And that's what we mean by a literary relationship. It means that Matthew and Mark were not themselves very likely eyewitnesses. And the earliest witness, by the way, to Mark said particularly, had said quite bluntly that Mark was not an eyewitness and that Mark got Mark's information from Peter but that Mark himself was not an eyewitness, and also said that some of the things that are in Mark are not in the actual order that they happened in the lifetime of Jesus, but that they actually were, uh, they were actually written down pretty much in the order that Mark heard them from Peter. So um, the important thing is to realize that the best explanation irrespective of what people in the first and second and third and fourth and fifth centuries said about the Gospels, um, irrespective of the patristic comments, comments about the Gospels, the most important um, evidence for what the Gospels are like is the Gospels themselves. And therefore, looking at Mark and looking at Matthew and looking at Luke, um, it is easy to come to the conclusion that we're not talking about three parallel eyewitnesses who heard things sometimes the same and sometimes quite differently, uh, but rather that Matthew and Luke had a copy of Mark and they used Mark as the skeleton of their Gospels. And so more than 90% of New Testament scholars believe that Mark was the first of the three synoptic Gospels to have been written. And so this is a theory, of course, and this theory, which has uh, gained great favor in the last, well, in the last almost 100 years, uh, in the English-speaking world ever since B.H. Streeter's book, The Four Gospels, A Study of Origins, um, and before that, uh, Adolf von Harnack's book on the Gospels, um, those two writers, Harnack in Berlin and B.H. Streeter at Oxford, were the main people that pretty much sold 
the theory of mark and priority to, to all the rest of us. And so this theory that Mark was first is called mark and priority. Okay? All right. Now, uh, if you believe in mark and priority, then this diagram will be of interest to you. You can see that Mark is the source of Matthew. Note the arrow coming down from Mark straight down to Matthew and the arrow coming diagonally over to Luke. So Mark was the source of Matthew and Luke according to the theory. Now, when you're looking at about 230 verses that are in Matthew and Luke that are not from Mark, um, the theory is the usually accepted theory, although many people don't accept the theory, but the usually accepted theory is uh, another source which we call Q. Q is short for Quella, which is the German word for source or spring. And so if you believe in the two source theory or the two document hypothesis, you believe that Mark and Q were the sources of Matthew and Luke. And then if you go along with what B.H. Streeter uh, did. Um, he, his was a little more fancy than this. But um, the material that's in Mark that's not from Q and um, in other words the material um, from Mark excuse me, the material in Matthew that's not from Mark and not from Q can be called M. And the material in Luke that's not from Q and not from Mark can be called L. But those are very unnecessary bells and whistles on what is really usually called the two document hypothesis. And so probably I think around 60-70% of New Testament scholars believe in the Q hypothesis. Um, a very, very articulate scholar at Duke University in the Department of Religion is a man named Mark Goodiger, uh, a brilliant scholar, and he has written a book called The Case Against Q. And so he believes in Mark and Priority, but is unconvinced that there was a separate source called Q. And so, uh, you know, it's an ongoing debate. Um, but probably, probably a majority of scholars believe that there was Q. And I believe that there may have been Q, but I'm just not too sure what Q was. And part of the problem with Q is no one's ever seen a copy of it. No one's ever quoted it in the early church. And also, some of the material that's supposed to be from Q, that's in Matthew and Luke, is quite different. And also is in a different order in Matthew than it is in Luke. So the Q hypothesis um, has its problems. Um, none the, on the other hand, it is, an, it is an explanation of the around 230 verses that uh, you find uh, in uh, uh, Matthew and Luke that are not in Mark. Um, for one thing, when you deal with what's, how do you get from Jesus to the Gospels? I mean, isn't that the most important question? Uh, we, know, we know what the Gospels say because we can read the text, but we'd like to know what Jesus said. Well, Jesus and his 12 disciples, original 12 disciples, spoke a Semitic language uh, called Aramaic, which is not a dialect of Hebrew, but is a separate uh, language from the ancient Near East. It's a Semitic language like Hebrew, like Arabic, uh, like Akkadian, like Ugaritic. They're all Semitic languages. Um, and the New Testament, however, was written in Greek and was absolutely positively not written in Aramaic. And so, somehow, the material that from Jesus. If this material does go back to the historical Jesus, as I believe some of it does, somehow you have to describe historically the transition between what Jesus said in Aramaic and what his disciples would have remembered in Aramaic to Hellenistic Greek in order for it to appear in the New Testament. And so it seems likely to me that this Jesus material, material that Jesus said, made the transition to Greek, perhaps at the oral stage. In other words, they were telling stories about what Jesus said and did in the Aramaic-speaking church, not long after Jesus' death and resurrection. And then eventually, 
Paul and Barnabas uh, and others were very active in uh, bringing the gospel to the Greek-speaking world. And they were tremendously successful. Uh, the, the disciples who tried to bring the gospel to uh, fellow Jews were not extremely successful. But nonetheless, Christianity really caught on among the Gentiles in the first century and then later. And so uh, the idea is that when the Gospels, I mean, originally the material that became the Gospels was Aramaic, and then on the mission field, uh, people started saying, okay, here's what Jesus said, here's what Jesus did. And so they did that, and we're still at the oral stage before the Gospels are written down. And so it was preached and taught in Greek-speaking churches. We, however, do not have any ancient manuscripts of Matthew or of the New Testament in Palestinian Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke. The most ancient text of Matthew that we have is in Hellenistic Greek, and the next oldest text of Matthew is in Latin. It's what's called the Old Latin. Jerome translated in the fourth century um, from the Greek, uh, and, but the, the New Testament already existed in the Vetus Latina, or Old Latin, and he retranslated it and it became the Vulgate New Testament. And he translated uh, from scratch, I suppose, the uh, Old Testament. Um, but the oldest version of the uh, New Testament is the version or translation of the New Testament into Latin. And that was as early as the second century. Um, Matthew, I mean, there is this rumor or there is this story, there is this oral tradition, I guess, that Matthew was originally written in Hebrew. And in the fourth century, the great church historian, Eusebius, who was present at the Council of Nicaea, he quoted Papias, who is supposed to have been a disciple of John. And Papias, who lived in the late first and very early second century, wrote this. Matthew composed the oracles in the Hebrew language, and each person interpreted them as best he could. So Matthew is supposed to have been written in Hebrew first by Matthew, and each person interpreted them as best he could, and that's from book three of the church history. That was written in the fourth century. But the problem is, um, probably Matthew originally, he said Hebrew, but probably Papias really meant Aramaic, which is the actual spoken Semitic language of Palestine rather than Hebrew. Yeah, they knew Hebrew because that's what they read the Bible in. The Hebrew Bible was in Hebrew. But the Greek text of Matthew does not look like it had a Hebrew or an Aramaic original. It may be that the Apostle Matthew was further back in the background. And it may be that the oracles Papias was talking about in the second century were not actually the same as the Gospel according to Matthew that we have. And so this is a very difficult question to which there, can, there cannot be a definitive answer based on the evidence that we have. If we had more evidence, we could give a definitive answer, but we can only give a tentative answer or tentative answers based on the evidence that we have, which is far from conclusive. But anyway, this is my diagram for how you get the Gospels. Starting at the top left, you have the oral teaching of Jesus, which was in Aramaic. And after Jesus' death and resurrection, the apostles went out and founded churches all over the place. And so the churches were originally Aramaic-speaking churches. And then Barnabas and Paul um, start a Greek-speaking Gentile church in Antioch. Actually, Barnabas started it. Uh, and they worked together for some years until they had quite a fight over Mark. But nonetheless, um, there were Aramaic-speaking churches in um, Syria, Palestine, Israel, whatever we're calling it. And then as Paul started going around the Mediterranean Sea and uh, visiting, um, visiting Greek-speaking synagogues, the kind of synagogue that he grew up in in Tarsus, and then he started telling people about Jesus. Then there began to grow Greek narratives 
about the words and deeds of Jesus. And so then these Greek narratives were eventually collected. Um, we don't know by whom first, but they were collected. Perhaps they were collected in different ways in different cities. But they're collected and um, they're extensively edited. The first collection, as far as we have evidence, would be either Q, which if Q existed would have been a saying source, and that would be sayings of Jesus, more or less sayings of Jesus, strung together like pearls on a string without a narrative structure, without a passion narrative, without anything about the resurrection um, or the death of Jesus at all. Uh, and if the Q hypothesis is correct, then that's what Q was, um, uh, not narratives, but sayings. And so Q sometimes is referred to as the saying source. Um, if the Q hypothesis is not correct, as it, will, as it well may not be, uh, the earliest narratives are put together in, by Mark. And so Mark, um, Mark apparently had pre-Markan sources, as we believe now. And so the narratives about Jesus' deeds that circulated first in Aramaic-speaking churches and then in Greek-speaking churches, these sayings were edited along the way uh, and edited and re-edited. Uh, and basically, Mark was the first, Matthew and Luke were next, uh, John was probably after that. And you can see the arrows here are different looking arrows and there's more than four of them. Um, but you can see that they became the gospels that we know, okay? So this is a very fallible uh, diagram that tries to be kind of accurate or tries to be at least not misleading. So there is a difference between the oral teaching of Jesus, which was Aramaic, and the Gospels which we have, which are Greek. Let me first tell you some things you ought to know. Uh, the Gospels are not transcripts of tape recordings of the teachings of Jesus. And the early church did not believe that they were. Um, the, uh, there is the tradition from Papias that uh, the Gospel of Mark was based on the reminiscences and memories of Peter. And that, it, and, that, and that Mark himself was not present during the, that time, uh, during the life of Jesus. And so you cannot consider Mark a transcript of a tape recording of the teaching of Jesus. For one thing, there were no tape recorders. Um, also, kindly do not think that the Gospels are the only sets of teachings that we have from the early church. Far from it. And please don't think that they are our earliest sources of historical information from the early church. Also, let's, let's get real about what the Gospels are. Um, first, the Gospels are first century interpretations of the teachings of Jesus. They've been, they've been um, when we see the Gospels, we're seeing stuff that was written in the mid to late first century, Jesus died and was resurrected in about the year 33, 30 or 33. And so decades have gone on between Jesus and uh, the earliest writings uh, of the Gospels. So they are interpretations of the teachings of Jesus without benefit of tape recordings. Um, the Gospels are our most important and earliest historical sources for our knowledge of Jesus and of his teaching. And so um, the Gospels certainly do contain bits and pieces, maybe big bits and pieces, of oral teaching that really did come from Jesus. And, but we have to remember, these bits and pieces of oral tradition are filtered through the lenses of the late first century. Um, and the late first century churches were in various different cities and places in the Roman Empire, in particular Pauline churches, you think of churches mostly around the Mediterranean Sea. So basically, the Gospels were not written in any one place, uh, and they were not written by any one person. Uh, and therefore, when you read them, you're reading first century interpretations of the teachings of Jesus.
Um, when we study the four Gospels, and especially when we study Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we usually do so in a book. It's usually a book bound in navy blue. Um, but that book that we use is called a synopsis. Um, the best one is the one by Kurt Aland that's called Synopsis of the Four Gospels. And the original one is called Synopsis Quarter War Evangeliorum, which has the full documentation of the, of the, of the sayings, including all the non-canonical parallels. And so uh, it includes Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Uh, and so when you're looking for a gospel passage and you want to know, learn more about it, the first thing you do is to pull out your synopsis and see if it's in Mark, see if it's in Matthew, see if it's in Luke, see if there's a parallel in John. And then compare how it's used in those Gospels. And that sometimes gives you a good idea as to where this saying came from, which is to say what sources it came from. And so when you compare a lot of the, a lot of the sayings of Jesus in the synopsis of the four Gospels, or in, for example, another one is very well known, it's called Gospel Parallels, edited by Burton Throckmorton. Uh, that's very well, that one is very well known. Um, but it allows you to look at the text in parallel columns and to come to your own conclusions about which of the gospel accounts of an event or teaching is earlier and which accounts seem to reflect subsequent editing uh, to the earlier accounts. And you can either do this in English or you can use Kurt Allen's big Greek synopsis, Synopsis Quadruor Evangeliorum, as I did in seminary and graduate school, and you can study them in Greek. And the, what's good about that is that you can look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke in parallel columns, and you can actually look at the word Mark used, and then you can look and see if the same word was used in Matthew and Luke, or if it was changed to a different word. So looking at all three of the Synoptic Gospels is usually very illuminating uh, as to which sayings are earlier, which sayings come from Mark, which sayings may come from that other source known as Q, or which, uh, or which sayings come strictly from Matthew or uh, from Luke. For example, the parable of the prodigal son is only in Luke. The parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds, is only in Matthew. So, uh, uh, whereas the confession of Peter, where Peter says, you are the Christ, uh, that is in Mark, but it's also in Matthew, and it's also in Luke. Um, there's only one, only one miracle that's in all four Gospels, and that's the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. So, it's very important to study them in the synopsis when you can. By the way, this is a pretty reasonable timeline. Uh, Jesus was born, it is believed, between 6 and 5 BCE. By the way, BCE is the same years as BC. BCE means before the Common Era. And then CE is the same years as AD. Um, Jesus was either um, crucified and resurrected in the year 30 CE or perhaps more likely 33 CE. Um, and Paul was converted later that year or in the following year. Um, Paul died uh, probably the year 62 while Nero was emperor of Rome. And then the Jerusalem temple um, was destroyed during the Jewish war between 66 uh, and 73 and the temple was destroyed in 70. Probably not long after 70 CE, or possibly not long before 70 CE, but I believe after uh, the Gospel according to Mark was written, and then if you believe in Mark and priority, then Matthew and Luke come after that. Well, what are the things which are important about Matthew? Well, let's start with the way that Matthew quotes the Old Testament. Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament scripture, and Matthew has this marvelous quotation formula where he says, these things happen in order to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, or whomever, saying, and then he quotes that piece of scripture. And so stuff that happens in the lifetime of Jesus uh, is understood to be the fulfillment of Old Testament 
prophecy. And uh, that is distinctive, that quotation formula is distinctive to Matthew. Uh, Mark and Luke and John don't have it. Uh, in contrast to the Gospel according to Mark, Matthew thinks that the church is actually a good thing. And he thinks that the apostles were actually pretty good students of Jesus. By the way, a disciple is in Latin is a discipulus, and it goes back to the Greek word mathetai, meaning students. Manthano is to teach, and mathetai are people who are taught, students. And so uh, that becomes discipuli in Latin, and so we're stuck with this word disciples in English, but why not just say students? Jesus was this teacher. In Mark, the apostles are the lousiest students around, whereas in Matthew, they're rather better students. And that's important because if, Ma uh, if Matthew is right, then the apostles were really good students of Jesus, and therefore what they say to the subsequent church is, um, uh, is authoritative because they, it reflects very well what Jesus said during his earthly life. So uh, Matthew thinks the church is really good and really important. And uh, Mark, on the other hand, seems to waste no opportunity of telling you just what schmoes the uh, 12 apostles were. Um, and so that's a very, very pronounced difference between Mark and Matthew. Mark doesn't think the disciples were any good. Uh, they had two problems. They didn't understand Jesus and they were not faithful to Jesus. And um, Matthew seems to have edited that right out. More about Matthew. Well, Jesus was Jewish. Um, Jesus was Jewish and there was never a moment in his life that he was not Jewish. And so, Matthew lays great emphasis on the Jewish roots of Jesus. For example, the uh, genealogy of Jesus at the very beginning of Matthew. How about that? And also, Matthew, like the other three Gospels, portrays Jewish leaders in Jerusalem as hypocritical, very opposed to Jesus and his movement, because they're afraid, probably, that the Romans are going to pounce on them. If there's any kind of rebellion against the Roman occupation forces, the Romans would basically go and kill everybody uh, in the most horrible death possible, which the Romans were good at. And so uh, Matthew, uh, along with the other Gospels, unfortunately portrays Jewish leaders in Jerusalem as hypocritical, as highly opposed to Jesus and his movement, as plotters and collaborators with the Roman occupation government in an attempt to get rid of Jesus and his movement. And so, um, yes, Jesus was Jewish. Uh, yes, the opponents of Jesus were Jewish. That doesn't mean they agreed with each other, you see. Um, and then there is the Jewishness of Matthew. There are elements of Matthew that help us to see the Jewishness of Jesus. That includes his genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 as well as the repeated use of Matthew's distinctive quotation formula. And then Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, has a very strongly Jewish ring to it. The woes in Matthew 23 refers to the division of the cup into two parts, and there are good parallels between that and rabbinic materials. How do you know if a, if a cup is dirty? Well, there's the inside of the cup, the outside of the cup, and the place where you hold the cup. Um, whereas in Matthew, it's the inside of the cup versus the outside of the cup. But nonetheless, that's a pretty good parallel. Um, then, of course, the Jewishness of Jesus is important because um, the controversies that Jesus gets into with the people referred to as the scribes and Pharisees, they now sound to us not like Jesus is somehow being anti-Jewish. That's ridiculous. Um, these debates now between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees sound like they are actually inner Jewish debates. In other words, they're both, Jesus is Jewish, his opponents in Jerusalem are Jewish. And so they are both debating the meaning 
of Old Testament scripture and the meaning of certain parts of Jewish tradition. They're both Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. His opponents in Jerusalem were Jewish. The Dead Sea Scrolls people were Jewish. And so that points us to the fact that there was no normative Judaism in the first century. The Dead Sea Scrolls, along with other Jewish documents, have shown us that Judaism in this time was a very diverse religion. And the very famous book, Judaism and Hellenism, by the late Martin Hingle, showed how many elements of Judaism, virtually all elements of Judaism, were thoroughly made Greek, thoroughly Hellenized. And so Judaism is, and Hellenism is a great book. Volume one is the text and volume two is the notes. That's how heavily documented it was. Uh, still an important book. In English, it's available from Fortress Press. There are some other Matthean themes um, that are important. Um, as Matthew saw the church in the late first century, which is when Matthew seems to have been written, to use Martin Luther's famous phrase, the church was a corpus per mixtum. Uh, a corpus per mixtum means a mixed body. And of course, I'm speaking particularly of the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds. Uh, namely, you've got good, sincere followers of Jesus, and in the church you also have people who are not good, sincere followers of Jesus. And that's the unfortunate way it is in the present age. However, in the age to come, God and God's angels will do the sorting out between the sincere people and the crooked people. And so God and his angels are going to do the sorting out, and therefore you and I, as uh, Christians, we don't have to worry so much about the sorting out between the good guys and the bad guys in the church, because God's going to do it. That's a Matthean point of view. And that is what you find in, the, in that Matthean parable, the, the wheat and the tares. Uh, the other thing is that uh, another big Matthean theme is that for all of his Jewish Christian perspectives and his having access to early material from Jewish Christianity, such as the Sermon on the Mount and such as Matthew 23, as far as I believe, Matthew is very interested in the Gentile mission of the church and therefore interested in the salvation of Gentiles. Um, the first worshipers of Jesus, other than Mary and Joseph, are pagan astrologers, pagan, ma pagan magicians. And that's, of course, um, Matthew 2, 1 through 12, is the vis visit of the magicians, the magi. And then in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, you have the Great Commission, where it says, go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to the goyim, to the nations, which means to the Gentiles. And so the first worshipers of Jesus in Matthew uh, are Gentile, indeed pagans, and the people that the missionaries are mostly sent to are the nations, the ethne, the goyim, the Gentiles. Also, uh, in uh, the woes of Matthew 23, there is a condemnation of the scribes and Pharisees who are hypocrites. And part of what they do is their activity and ministry, which helps to exclude people from the kingdom of God. The more the uh, scribes and Pharisees do their thing, the more people who are not Jews and who are not practicing Judaism in a certain way, the more people like that are excluded from the kingdom of God. And uh, Matthew de deeply dislikes that. So now, for the rest of our hour, um, we can look at, um, briefly, at uh, Matthew 1, 1 through 2, 12. Um, the traditional title of each of the four Gospels is the Gospel according to Matthew, or Mark, or Luke, or John. And this witnesses the fact that it's called the Gospel, according to Matthew, and using that term, the gospel according to, witnesses to the early idea that there's only one gospel. The gospel is the saving message about Jesus. And that is the way that Paul uses it, Paul being the earliest writer of the New Testament. Paul uses the term gospel, and he never, ever means a written work that is a biography of Jesus. And therefore, there's only one gospel in Paul, 
and uh, it's not a written work. And evidence does not show that the title, the Gospel according to Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, there is no hard evidence that shows that these titles were original to the Gospels. Because, depending on when you, uh, when you it depends on when you think the Gospels were written, the Gospels were cited anonymously without the ascription to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for some 70 years by early Christian authors um, in the second century CE, in the late first century and early second century CE. So for 70 years, they didn't, if these titles existed, they were not being used. And that, uh, that is, that's very, um, you can raise questions about that. Most likely, the fact that of eventually by the late first century and into the second century, churches are getting copies of more than one gospel. In other words, previously, a church would have a copy of Mark or Matthew or Luke. And then later, they are copying each other's gospels, you know, from different churches in different cities. And then when you begin to have more than one gospel, then uh, it makes sense to have these titles according to Matthew, according to Mark, etc. So that is the traditional explanation of the uh, original lack of the titles of the Gospels. And uh, recently there are people who certainly challenge uh, what I just told you. So you'll see it different ways in the secondary literature. And then in Matthew 1, 2 through 17, you have a very long genealogy of Jesus. Um, it begins with um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs of Israel, and it moves forward in time to Jesus. And it ends with G Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christos. Christos, of course, is Greek for Mashiach, the anointed one. And in contrast, in the Lucan genealogy, which is not until Luke 3, 23 and following, the Luke genealogy starts with Joseph and goes backward in time to Adam, who was a son of God. So the, you both have, Matthew and Luke both have genealogies, but they're different from each other. Um, in uh, Davies and Allison's fine three-volume commentary on Matthew, uh, there are some important things said. The important thing about the genealogy, first of all, is that the genealogy of Jesus offers proof of the title of Jesus as son of Abraham and son of David. And we're going to find out that Jesus is referred to as son of David. Particularly in Mark, Jesus is addressed as son of David by the demons. And therefore, Jesus' descent through his earthly father Joseph qualifies him as uh, a Messiah in the line of King David. Jesus came in the right time. Uh, Matthew 1, 2 through 17 divides history into periods and places the appearance of Jesus at the end of the exilic period. So Jesus came at the right time. That's a big deal in Galatians 4 as well. And then um, Davies and Allison uh, comment that Matthew 1 outlines a story whose surety is God and whose culmination is Jesus Christ. God gave the promises to Abraham uh, the patriarch and David the king. And God, being God, is going to continue to be faithful to his promises despite all appearances to the contrary. And his faithfulness is fully manifested in the birth of Jesus. Uh, there are some unusual unions in Jesus' genealogies, even unions with Gentiles. I think Rahab the harlot is in there somewhere. But even though there are irregular and unusual unions, they are nonetheless blessed by God in establishing and continuing the line of David. Uh, and of course, Jesus being a Messiah is a king, and if you're a king in Israel, you need to be in the line of David. Um, and the heritage of the mixed Jewish and Gentile church in the late first century CE was not found in a shared racial heritage. It's not that Jesus was part Gentile, no. It could only be found in the adherence to the words and person of Jesus himself. Despite belonging to the rootless Hellenistic world of the first century, Davies and Allison say, the church, by virtue of its union with Jesus, 
had a secure link with the remote past. So the genealogy um, does not establish Jesus as being other than Jewish and being other than in the line of David. Um, there's another three-volume commentary by the late Ulrich Lutz, who taught in Göttingen and later went back to Switzerland. Uh, and in his three-volume commentary in volume one, um, Ulrich Lutz said that Jesus is son of David that is sent to Israel by God as his anointed one, and at the same time he is son of Abraham because through him, the Israelite, God wants to speak to the entire Gentile world. That is the message of this text. So it is Jesus who is Jewish, who is in the line of David, nonetheless was sent at, to Israel as the anointed one, but it's as the anointed one of Israel that Jesus also speaks to the Gentile world. In other words, Jesus is a Jew, a son of Israel. His earliest followers understood him to be a Messiah sent to save Israel. Um, and then eventually, um, it will emphasize in chapter 2, 2, 1 through 12, the visit of the Magi, will emphasize to the readers uh, that Jesus is for the entire nations, the entire Goyim, the entire Gentiles. Then later, um, you have the flight to Egypt. Um, it's dangerous for Jesus to stay in Israel because there is Herod. And so basically, um, after Jesus is born, um, first of all, uh, God intervenes to get Joseph not to divorce Mary. Um, Emmanuel means God with us. And so Jesus has a divine origin, the Holy, the Holy Spirit, and a human birth. And so both Matthew and Luke make it clear that Jesus is not the biological son of Joseph. Um, and of course, the name in, in Matthew, the name Jesus, Jesus in Greek, is Greek for Yehoshua or Joshua, which means Yah saves, Yahweh saves. And so that's why it says, you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then the uh, next part is, of course, the passage that is read on the Feast of the Epiphany in the church, and that is the coming of the Magi. Um, I really am not happy with the translation wise men. That is a little bit too euphemistic for me. Uh, we know from the Greek magical papyri that Amagos is a magician. There's no doubt about that. And so Amagos is a magician, and Magoi is the plural, and that's how you get Magi in Latin. Um, so there's been a lot of subsequent Christian embroidery of this. Uh, nowhere in the text does it say that there were three of them. Nowhere in the text does it say that the Magoi, the magicians, were kings. And of course, we know they were magicians because they were astrologers. Okay, what could be clearer than that? So why not just call them magicians or magi? Uh, this business of wise men, I think that's a poor, poor translation. It's just a little bit too euphemistic. The most important thing that one finds in this very surprising text is the fact that these three astrologers were Gentiles. And it is three, well, excuse me, they're not necessarily three, there could be five. However many they were, they were the first to come and worship Jesus. And so in uh, Matthew, the first worshipers of Jesus, other than Mary and Joseph, are the Jewish shepherds near Bethlehem. And in Matthew, the first worshipers of Jesus, other than Mary and Joseph, are pagan astrologers. And so uh, that tells you a lot about the differences between uh, Matthew and Luke. And it shows you that there, it's very likely that there was a good bit of time between the birth of Jesus and the writing of Matthew and the writing of Luke, so that there would be time for this kind of different, t time for this kind of theological and historical reflection to occur, and to occur in two different ways. Um, and then uh, next week we will look at uh, chapter 2, verse 13, through the end of chapter 4.
and we'll talk a little bit about Second Temple Judaism. We'll talk about John the Baptist. We'll talk a little bit about the Dead Sea Scrolls people um, and uh, the beginnings of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. And so um, I'm hoping that this um, video recording turns out well and I shall see in just a few minutes. Nonetheless, uh, you are welcome to look at all of these videos. We will have a playlist on our YouTube channel and our YouTube channel is in YouTube. You go to YouTube and then you go to Rustin Redeemer and you'll see a total of, I believe, 12 playlists. And this playlist will be called Gospel of Matthew or Matthew. And so uh, that's where this one will be and that's where uh, the second one will be and there will be a total of seven on Matthew in this playlist as it's called in YouTube. So. Until our next session, I bid you a good afternoon, and today I wish you could see our parish hall because there's Mardi Gras colors everywhere, and we're getting ready for our Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper tomorrow evening. So uh, uh, I hope that everyone uh, will have had a good chance to rejoice a little bit before Lent begins, and then as Lent begins, I hope that everyone will uh, take the time and effort to have a good and holy Lent.